Well, good afternoon, folks. My name is Dan First. I've been playing in this field for a long time, basically since dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> and I think this is one of the better years. I do this sort of update on a pretty much yearly basis. And I think what's, what I'm going to tell you about today may truly change the face of scleroderma. It's going to be something which will allow us to prove that drugs actually work. But what I want to do first is let you know that I work with a lot of different companies to get my research done. And what I want to talk to you about is a number of things. One thing about Raynaud's phenomenon. And then we've been finding a bit about the heart in scleroderma. And I want you to learn a bit about that. And then I really want to talk about therapies. I want to mention some of the newest data on stem cell transplantation. I want to talk to you about how to measure change in this disease and use some of the new therapies to show you how we do that. We can do it by doing the skin score. We can do it by measuring lung function. How about lung function, everybody? Yeah. And then we can do it by combining measures. And in each case, I'll talk to you about some of the therapies in which we've tried these things. The first thing is Raynaud's phenomenon. It turns out that a fair number of people who have scleroderma have family members who have Raynaud's. And so it might be useful for you to know what the probability is that your family member is going to get something else. So this was a trial of about 250 people, and they followed them for five and a half years. And in five and a half years, only three and a half percent of the patients developed a connective tissue disease. Among those, you can see on the graph that the most common was lupus, not scleroderma, and then came scleroderma, and then rheumatoid arthritis, and then something called Sjogren's syndrome. And so the good news is that your family members are not likely to develop another rheumatic disease, something that's good to know for them. But I want to talk more about heart involvement. This is a cartoon of the heart. And most of you know this, of course. That is, there's the myocardium, that's the muscle, the conducting system or electrical system that makes sure the heart is functioning in a, in, a, in a way that works. There are the valves that control the blood flow. And then there's the pump and the reservoir. And things can happen in any, any of those areas. Why is it important? Well, if we can define it, we now can treat it. And what we're finding is that it really makes a difference. You can see here the top line is someone who has scleroderma but has no internal organ involvement. And then the next two lines you can see include lung and heart. And you can see that if people have heart involvement and you follow them for 10 years, that in fact some of them don't survive very well. In fact, about a third of them die. So heart involvement can be pretty important. And when we look at this more carefully, in the top, what you see is the change in the incidence of people dying from these various parts of scleroderma over time. And on your left at the top, that's lung involvement. The next one is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And you can see those are the most common causes. But the next one is heart disease. And when you look, you can see that going from left to right is over time. Left is around, I think it's around 1990. And the right part of that is about 2014. And what you can see is that if you look at the heart involvement, that's number three and four, there's a trend to less in a heart involvement. Contrast that with the one on the right you can't read it, but it's cancer. 
And cancer is increasing in scleroderma patients. Something we really have to pay attention to, isn't it? And when we look at the causes of death in the bottom, you can see that the most frequent cause of death is still the lung or pulmonary hypertension in the lung or cancer, and then comes the heart. So the heart is important in that. So if that happens, how can we predict if someone's going to get in trouble? So this looked at about 400 patients and over three years very carefully examined the heart. And one of the things that's associated with heart death is age. That shouldn't come as much of a surprise. Those of us who are 90 years old, no. Um, uh, you know, we die more of heart disease later on. So age is a factor. And then, if you look at the heart itself, this is a measure of the heart itself, there's a trend, anything over one means there's an increased probability that the heart, if there's heart involvement, there's going to be a problem. And if the heart is not pumping well and the GLS looks at how the heart pumps, that's a big deal. That really increases the probability of dying by about 30%. I think it's worth pointing out that women have a decreased probability of dying from heart disease. You see that's 0.5. One is what you'd expect if there was no effect. 0.5 is less death from heart disease among women. And you know, we all do echocardiograms. Again, how many of you have had an echocardiogram? Raise your hand. You see, we all do echocardiograms. This looked at 72 patients. And you can see on the graph that 50% of the patients on an MRI, you know what an MRI is, it's a very good way of looking at tissue. 50% of the patients on an MRI had heart involvement. What's interesting is that 50% of the patients had a normal echo and yet they had heart involvement. So now we have to think, is there something we need to be doing in the future to see if there's heart involvement? So what's the big thing that I'm not telling you about? Anybody? The big thing is a so what? So what? If you have heart involvement and it means nothing, what do I care? I bet you most people have some heart involvement. So the question is, does it make a difference? So what I'm saying here is, yes, we're seeing heart involvement. We don't know yet what it means. Because remember, this is early research. And so what was done is a group of fellows that I work with got together and did what's called a systematic literature review and analysis of studies. You look in the world's literature in a very systematic way, and what was found was 2,600 articles about the heart and scleroderma. And then applied inclusion and ex exclusion criteria. For example, did they define what they meant by scleroderma? Did patients have multiple diseases? And once you did all the exclusions and inclusions, it cut out about 700, and there were 1,800 left. And then, when you actually looked at the article, till now, all we were doing was looking at the title and the abstract, it came down to 250. And finally, when we actually looked at all the data, there were 172 articles that we looked at. That's a very good number. And here's what was found. First of all, what you see here is that the, um, the reservoir function, the atrium, could be involved on either the left or the right side, both sides of the heart. And that the ventricles could also be involved. And in each case, 15 to 20%. This is, comes from the literature, remember. And in those patients who had an autopsy, here's what was found. 80% of the patients had inflammation in their muscle. 
and 60% had scarring. And about 30% had scarring in their conduction system. So what does that mean? Well, if there's scarring in the conduction system, there's likely to be an arrhythmia, irregular heart rhythm. So a lot of these folks had inflammation. This is what it looked like. On the top is a picture of a normal heart muscle. And then in the middle, you can see on the left, some of that blue-gray, that's scarring. And if you look on the right, you see those, those brown little dots? That indicates inflammation. And when it was looked at more carefully, the kind of inflammation that was found was the kind of inflammation that we worry about in scleroderma. That is, lymphocytes, white cells, T and B white cells, that are involved in the heart muscle. So this backs up what we saw in the other studies, showing that yes, it's fairly common. Yes, there's inflammation. And yes, there can be scarring. The next step, remember this is research, is to find out what it means. So we have to find and look at the patients and over time see how they do. Again, it's important because truly we can treat this. So if we find it and we look and find out who's most likely to get it and when it's likely to become important, we can treat it and cut it off at the pass. So this is a really encouraging look at the, in the involvement of the heart in scleroderma. But really, we want to talk about therapies. And the first one I want to talk about is stem cells. So when you do a stem cell therapy, what you do is you, you turn the bone marrow in the person on. You tweak it and turn it on and make it turn out lots and lots of cells, some of which are very, very early cells. And then you take those cells out, out of a vein, and separate them. And the next thing you do is you Oops, wrong way. You kill the immune system because in scleroderma, the immune system is turned against us. So we're going to kill the immune system. And in, in the U.S., we really did a thorough job. We gave medicines. We gave radiation. We did all sorts of things. Once that system is killed, we put in those early cells and let them grow up. Now, they're growing up in the presence of scleroderma. So that's normal to them. And so they don't react. And so the body can heal itself. So that's a basic idea. So now, does it work? Well, here's a patient in whom we did stem cell, did biopsies over time. And what you can see in the top, how thick the skin is. And you can see at the top that there's a lot of disorganization, stuff just all over the place. At one year, the skin is getting less thick and getting more organized, and by five years, it's completely normal. So if someone says to you, ah, this is an untreatable disease, no. It can go back to normal. The skin is completely treatable, and by extension, things inside can also be treated. So what we did in this trial, and there have been two trials, one in Europe, one here, another one, uh, a smaller trial, but this, these two are the major ones. And what we did in this trial is in one case we did the transplant, and then we randomly assigned the patient either to transplant or high-dose cyclophosphamide. We know that works. So the question is, does transplant work better? And here you can see one of the examples of what's going on. This is going out to 12 years now. The tr trials you've seen to date are probably three or four years, but this is 12 years, very different. And what you see here is the number of patients who relapsed. Now don't let anyone tell you the transplant is magic. You never get something for nothing, nothing works 100%. 
So here we were looking at relapse, and what you can see is the patients who had the transplant, that's the lower number, by four years, about 15% of them had relapsed, and by 12 years, about 20%. In contrast, the patients who had the cytoxin, although they responded, by 12 years, 65% of them had relapsed. A real difference, and a long-term difference. And here is an example of what we showed this year. And what you can see is the probability of survival in the, either one of these, but let's look at the top. You can see that over 11 years, first, there's a drop. And if you look very carefully at the left side, the patients who are on the transplant, that's a solid line, were dying early. And they, more of them were dying early than the cytoxan group. Why? Because of side effects from the treatment. You never get something for nothing. But once we got them through that, you can see that they survived long term compared to the cytoxan group, which also survived, but not as well. So clearly this works, and in fact, there have been two well-controlled studies and one, one not so good study, all of which showed that this works. So for the five or 10% of patients who need this, this is a therapy that works. Why is it a small number of patients? Well, let me show you this first. This is one of my patients, and you can see how well he did over the years turned pretty much back to normal. But what it says here is, may regrow hair, possible side effects, high blood pressure, nausea, dizziness, kidney dysfunction, liver damage, insomnia, headaches, memory loss, double vision, and the hair will fall out if you stop. It's worth a try. Okay. But the point is, you never get something for nothing. So what was the downside of using high-dose stem cell transplantation? And this is 70 patients, and this is long-term. Short-term, things can happen. You can get infections, um, things can happen in the heart, and so on. But most of the time, you can get through that. So what are the long-term consequences? Here, there were two patients out of the 70 who developed something that was a precancer called myelodysplastic syndrome. Okay, one of them died at six years. There was one patient who developed lung cancer. In fact, because they were in the trial, they probably survived because we did the high resolution CT scan on a routine basis, found this tiny little lesion, treated it, he survived. It was a she. Then about 5% of patients get thyroid problems easy to treat, and about 11% get cataracts. So this isn't a benign therapy, but for those people who need it, it's really good. So we've talked about that, but what we need is to look at how we can measure things so that we can tell if a drug works. So I'm going to talk about two things. First, the skin score. It's something we use all the time. And second, the force vital capacity. That's part of the lung testing. Okay? Because again, that's something we use all the time. And I'm going to give you some examples of how this worked. This is how we do a skin score. There are 17 areas of the body. We palpate them. And this is really rocket science, right? Zero is, yep, it's OK. One, yeah, I think it's not normal. Two, yep, it's abnormal. Three, wow, is it abnormal, okay? Turns out that that is pretty good if you train people. So that's how we do it. And this measurement was subjected to very careful testing to make sure that it was really valid. And we, could, we tested it against a gold standard. We looked at whether when you did it twice, you got the same number. We looked whether it changed. We looked whether it was able to tell drug A from drug B. I'm going to be some of that. All of those, it did. It is a valid measure. 
Here's the criterion, that's the gold standard. And what we did here is we did skin biopsies and measured it against skin score. Skin biopsy is for real, we know that's real. And so what you see here is that the correlation between the skin score and the biopsy was 80%. It's real. And here, in the stem cell patients, you could see that it changed. It responded, going from 30, which is very high, nearly down to, to 5 in some patients. So it's responsive. And when we looked at the skin score and tested it in a double-blind study versus placebo, methotrexate versus placebo, we could show that methotrexate had a 90% probability of making the skin better. Okay? It's an example of where the MRSS, modified Rodman skin score, worked. And when we looked at the study that we did of cytoxan orally versus placebo, and we looked at a 12-month study, again, double-blind, what we saw was that the skin score worked. It went down more in the cytoxan group than in the placebo group. It went down by three. It's not a lot, but it went down. It was only in patients with diffuse disease because all of this is tested in diffuse disease, not limited disease, so there's a bit of a problem when we come to that. And when we looked at the skin score in a number of studies, the results were these. The first two are studies of Actemra, anti-IL-6, and you see the MRSS? In neither case were they statistically different from placebo. To be statistically different, it has to be 0.05 or less, and it wasn't. And then we looked at Orencia, Abitacep. Nope, didn't make it. And then we looked at Riosaquat. That's a drug you'll see out there. It's used for pulmonary hypertension and was being tested. Nope, didn't make it. And then we looked at something I'll tell you much more about, a drug called Linabasum. It's a cannabinoid, and nope, didn't make it. So you see, although it does work sometimes, it really doesn't work a lot. This is how it looked, in fact. This is with the Actemra, and you can see the blue line was going down slightly more rapidly than the green line. See that? But it wasn't statistically different. A trend, but not statistically different. So MRSS sometimes works, but a lot of the time just doesn't do it. And in fact, the Temer trial, we did a phase three trial, trying to get it approved for use in scleroderma, and the FDA insisted that we use the skin score. It did not make it. So it was not approved, but we now have to look at another measure. Let's look at the forced vital capacity. What is that? That's how rapidly you can, sorry, how much air you can blow out totally. If any of you have done these, they're just lots of fun. They'll say, blow out, blow out, blow out, blow out. You're dead, blow out, blow out, right? You gotta get all the air out. And in the cytoxan versus placebo trial, you can see that the cytoxan group improved more. Above the line is improvement. And you can see that those patients who um, improved by at least 5% more, were more frequent in cytoxan than placebo. On the other hand, more patients got worse on placebo than on cytoxan. You see that? And in fact, it was statistically different, with a difference of 3% between them. So it actually worked in the cytoxan group. And when we looked more carefully, we could e even make it look much better. If a patient has a high skin score and has significant um, uh, scarring on the lung, then the difference isn't 2%, it's 10%. 
So if we take patients who have high skin and lots of scarring, they're much more likely to respond. And if it have low skin score and not a lot of scarring, you can see there's no difference, 0.6%. So we can predict which patients are going to respond in terms of FEC when you use cytoxin. And when you look at tocilizumab, remember that's the one that didn't make it on the skin score, what this looks at is in the bottom to the right is improvement, to the left is getting worse. See the minus and the plus? And what you can see is the tocilizumab at all points, the green line, is better than the blue line, placebo. So throughout, tocilizumab works on the lung. But as I told you, we had to use the skin score. And though, so although it really works in the lung, the FDA said, wrong buzzard breath, you can't have it. So, what are we doing? Well, we're using it, of course. Okay? And we're using it off-label. And we're using it because it works on the lung. It also kind of works on the skin, by the way. So, so far, we've talked about single measures. And we've described certain studies that show you that it works. Cytoxan works, methotrexate works, tocilizumab works in certain areas. But we ought to look at combined measures because if you put things together, maybe it's better. So scleroderma has a number of validated manifestations. And scleroderma, you all know, isn't a skin disease. It involves all sorts of things, the heart, the lung, the GI tract. And in other diseases, when you use combined measures, they work. The combined measures in rheumatoid arthritis work. The combined measures in lupus work. The combined measure in vasculitis works. So a combined measure makes a lot of sense, not only because of that, but we want to get a feel for the overall disease. So Dinesh Khanna and myself and Phil Clements and Maureen Mays and a bunch of us started working on developing a combined response index. What we did was, first of all, we asked a bunch of experts what they think would change. We got 170 different measures. And then we applied those measures in 200 patients over time. And then we got together and got the statistician to grind this all down to the fewest number that could show a change. And then we ask the question exactly what is important. And so we ended up with a two-step process. We first asked about cardiopulmonary renal worsening. And if any of those happened, then the probability that these patients were going to improve was zero. Probability of success was defined as zero. If, on the other hand, they did not have one of those step ones, then we looked at a bunch of other things to see if they made probability by that number. These are the important ones. If a patient had renal crisis, probability of response was zero. I don't care what happened in the skin. If their lungs went south, that's a failure. If their heart didn't work, if they got pulmonary hypertension. So if any of these happened, the probability of success, by definition, was zero. What that does is it captures function and it captures survival. And the FDA says that if you are successful in one of three areas, feeling, function, or survival, your drug can be approved. So here, it captures function and survival. The other things that ended up being looked at is the skin score, the force vital capacity, and a function of, fun of, of um, 
activities of daily living called the health assessment questionnaire. I do that in every one of my patients. And then what the patient thinks is going on and what the doctor thinks is going on. And those are combined in this very simple um, um, computerized number set up there. Really simple, right? I have no idea what that means. Okay. But somehow, magically, it all gets to put together, and you get a per patient probability of success. And so you add up the number of patients and their probability of success in one group versus the other. So we're going to apply this to the tocilizumab study. Remember, tocilizumab failed in the skin. Okay. So it failed the FDA. And we look at step one, you can see that a total number of 13 events occurred in the placebo group versus six in the treatment group. So step one looks encouraging, doesn't it? And then we looked at those five measures, and you see them here. And you look for the p-value. And what you see is that the Forced vital capacity was clearly separating drug from placebo, but none of the others did. However, when we applied the CRIS, 89% probability in tocilizumab versus 25% probability on placebo. It worked. So although the individual measures didn't do it, the combined measure worked. I'm going to go on now and talk about lenabasum. This is a cannabinoid. No, it isn't, it isn't marijuana, OK? It works in the same family, actually. And to do that, you need to know a little bit about immunity. It gets a little technical here. There are two kinds of immunity. It's called innate and adaptive. The innate is a very primitive one. It responds to patterns. Its function is to guard against infections. The adaptive is much more pinpoint. And it can be very, very careful about what it affects. And that's the one that's affected with T cells and B cells and stuff like that. And what lenabasum does is it disconnects the innate from the adaptive, leaving them each intact. So the body can still respond in those patterns to infection but it isn't turned on by the innate system to turn on the adaptive system. And the result of that is decreased inflammation, decreased cells that cause immunity, decreased fibrosis, decreased collagen production. All the things we'd like to see in scleroderma. So we looked at all those five measures in a study, a double-blind study, very small one, and you can see that only two out of five made it. The MD Global and the Activities of Daily Living, both of those less than 0.05, none of the others were. But look at the CRIS. When you look at the CRIS, 33% probability on the lenabasum, less than 1% probability on the placebo. It made it. Of course, you never get something for nothing, right? So what's the downside? Well, some people got tired. There was some achiness. Some people got a little nervous. No one got a bigger appetite, by the way. And there were no addiction potential. This was tested. So now let's look at the CRIS versus the MRSS. The CRIS worked in four out of five of the measures of which only, no, none out of five worked when it looked at the skin score. So here you have a game changer. Studies that looked like they didn't work were actually working. And very importantly, it turns out that the FDA is now accepting the CRIS as a measure of response. 
So what, I, what I've told you today is a little bit about Raynaud's phenomenon, heart involvement, talked about some therapies which really catch you up on what's happened in the last year in terms of therapies, but most importantly, I really believe this measure isn't perfect yet. We still have some work to do on it, but it's going to allow us to show drugs that work and give patients treatments for their scleroderma. Thank you very much.